Now imagine you have the skill to save someone's life, but the surgery could have terrible consequences. It's the kind of choice neurosurgeons face almost every day. Now one of Britain's finest has written a book about what it's like to carry out operations that carry grave risks. Henry Marsh gave his first television interview about the book to Katie Razzle and described just what it's like to drill down into people's brains. And just to issue the obvious warning, there are images of brain surgery in Katie's report. I often have to cut into the brain. It is something I hate doing. I cut into it with a small scalpel and make a hole through which I push with a fine sucker. The idea that my sucker is moving through thought itself, through emotion and reason, scissors again, that memories, dreams and reflections should consist of jelly is simply too strange to understand. All I can see in front of me is matter. An extract from Henry Marsh's book, Do No Harm. The story of 30 years spent trying to save lives and sometimes failing. This neurosurgeon operates on the most complex part of what makes us human. But when it goes wrong, brain surgery comes at huge cost to the patient and the doctor himself. Right, ready? There are some terrible moments. Um, doctors don't like talking about this very much. Um, but it, you'd have to be a sort of psychopath not to be deeply distressed by things going wrong. And I think most, um, most, most particularly surgeons, um, have lots of pretty moments of black despair, particularly, I think, in neurosurgery. I met Mr Marsh in the South London Hospital where he carries out some of the 400 or so operations he does every year. One, two, three, four. Here we, go. we were privileged to film the team treating a woman with a malignant brain tumour. Without an operation, this otherwise healthy pensioner's life will end in months. But neurosurgical decisions are rarely this clear-cut. Craniotomy, it's very uncertain and things often do go wrong. Um, if I'm faced by a very difficult operation, there is a significant risk I could leave the patient desperately disabled. Now, if I operate, am I being brave by taking on a very difficult case, or am I being reckless? And if I don't operate, am I being wise, or am I being a coward? It's these dilemmas that are explored in his book, and previously in an award-winning documentary that follows Mr Marsh to Ukraine. Topical now, but when the English surgeon first visited in 1992, he found medieval conditions in the operating theatres and patients dying unnecessarily and decided he must help. There's a physical conditions in the hospitals. are terrible. There's no disinfectants, there's no electricity. It's a nightmare. And yet these were sort of more these educated doctors. You know, many of them were kind of having to pretend everything was normal and OK, when obviously it wasn't. Conditions have improved, with second-hand equipment brought by Marsh from London, though a Kiev market is scoured for parts, and problems not found in the UK do still arise. Pressure is a bit flat. One heartbreaking tale from Ukraine sums up the tragedy that can result from a brain operation. How can you do nothing? How can you say, go away and die? This little girl's tumour was curable, but the surgery didn't end happily. Because of my operations, she had a terrible last two years to her life. She was paralyzed, disabled, couldn't really have been much worse. If the patient is deaf damaged, you have failed, and it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. There's a bit in the book where you say, my past disasters parade before me like ghosts. Yes, they do, in some of the more stressful operations. I start remembering when I'm deciding, how, do I pull out that last little bit of tumour or do I reposition the aneurysm clip? When you start thinking about all those previous cases. What do you have to do, push them away? No, because they'll guide me as to what the right thing to do is. There is something almost godlike about the surgeon's ability to prolong life and cause death. The patient in South London is lucky. Her operation will succeed. And though what we're about to show isn't for the faint-hearted, it's incredible to watch doctors delve into something as complex as the brain. To witness the removal of a tumour from an organ we still understand so little, we don't even really know what a thought consists of. We do know, though, that the patient wakes up. Less clear is how she might have reacted to her surgeon's oft-used joke. If an operation's gone well, I'll say to the patient, 
you know, I really enjoyed that. And they are offended by this, that something that's so horrible for them should be a source of pleasure for me. And I then say, if you think about it, the last thing you want to do is be operated on by a surgeon who doesn't enjoy doing it. Then they laugh and get the joke. He's clearly a maverick. Perhaps it comes with the territory. He's created this therapeutic garden for patients, a legacy ahead of his imminent retirement. You can get away a bit from this ghastly feeling of being in prison all the time, which most hospitals are like. But there may be some here who won't miss him when he's gone. You can't go into an NHS hospital without all these notices everywhere, telling you do this, don't do that. Well, I won't use the lifts, because every time there's this bloody voice saying, Ray, please wash your hands. And I, I'm not sure how effective that is. Maybe it does work, but I, I find it very irritating. Irritation with the NHS will see him leave Britain next year to work abroad, taking with him what he's learnt about the human brain and the hundred billion cells contained within it.